pleasing to me. <laughs> okay, we have a couple of announcements. First of all, sophomore review is coming up. How many of you are sophomores? I see some hands. Excellent. Good for you. You're, that means you're almost halfway through your program. Uh, sophomore review is a new assessment tool we're using this year. If you are a sophomore or you're planning to register for junior level coursework next year, you want to go ahead and stay after the talk tonight for a very short meeting and information about sophomore review, which is coming up in about three weeks. Secondly, I think we have had some successes this last week, something about some people won something, something happened, what? Yes, you remember last week we had Johnny and Ashley, or the week before, announcing their, yeah, last week, they were running for ASC, and they both won. Very exciting, congratulations, guys. Okay, well, it's a pleasure for me to introduce my good friend, Ryan Thompson, who lives and works in Chicago, Illinois. There he is a studio artist and associate professor of art and design at Trinity Christian College. His ongoing Department of Natural History projects engage a range of complex and peculiar relationships between humans and the natural world. Recent projects have been featured in Cabinet Magazine, The New Yorker, LA Times, Making the Geologic Now, Format P Magazine, Earthworks, and Reframing Photography. What? It's a long list. <laughs> He's also exhibited at places such as iBeam in New York, Gallery Analyze Forever in Geneva, Switzerland, Lynx Hall in Chicago, Evanston Art Center in Chicago, Root Division in San Francisco, and Mila Kunst Gallery in Berlin, Germany, uh, among others. So it's a pleasure to introduce Ryan tonight. I'm super excited to hear his talk. Welcome, Ryan Thompson. Slides? Are we gonna, or is there? Can we dim the lights a little bit? Ah, very nice. Perfect. Uh, so thanks for the invite. This is a pretty amazing um, Monday night you have. Not, not tonight, but you know, just in general, that you get to come here on Monday night and listen to lectures by all different types of folks. Um, I'm jealous. I wish someone put together a lecture program just for me. Uh, all I do is like show up. Um, and I'm glad to be part of it, a little part of it. Um, let's see. It's been nice getting to know a couple students in the dark room. I've been making photograms. I'll show you a couple images. I don't have good images at the end of the, of the work, but I'm producing one of the shares for the art share. Um, and it's been fun playing in the dark room. I don't have a dark room at home or at my home institution, so uh, if you have a chance to take a, take a photo class, it's a lot of fun. It's magic. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about a series of projects that I've grouped under um, a sort of moniker uh, with which I understand my work called the Department of Natural History. In graduate school, one of my professors told me that I make work that's like a natural history museum. And about a year later, uh, I thought, yeah, that's, that is true, what she said. I really like natural history museums. I really like science. I really like thinking about perception uh, and finding new ways of uh, Playing information in a visual way. So I got the domain Department of Natural History and I started kind of making work in that vein. Um, and it helped me sort of figure out, you know, I, I think a lot of artists and designers are attracted to lots of different things in the world and this is one way to kind of like focus my attention. You know, it's like being a crow in a, in a, like a world that's just plated in chrome, like everything is interesting. Um, so uh, within that, like this helps me kind of figure out like what is specifically interesting and what's going to kind of make sense for my specific practice uh, being an artist. Um, so the Department of Natural History is one way that, that I do that. Um, and here's some questions I ask as a part of that. Um, number one, how can I, how can we better understand our place in history? And I'm thinking about history both in terms of like the micro scale and macro scale. So our local history, um, you know, this place, this state, this country, uh, global and then also cosmic. I'm very interested in time scales and trying to better understand our place in history um, on a very, very broad time scale. 
Number two, what role do images and objects play in how we perceive and understand the natural world? As a visual artist, um, I'm good, or at least I hope I'm good at making images that interpret and sort of respond to the world and help other people appreciate it and kind of investigate it. Um, and number three, how might I make work that engenders transformational thinking? So it's, for me, it's not enough to just sort of be curious and to um, think about it, but also to hopefully get other people to kind of think in new and interesting ways about the world that we inhabit. Um, so this is something that I've been chasing for a while. This is Carl Sagan's, Carl Sagan's cosmic calendar. He's overlaid the history of the universe on a Earth calendar. So January 1st, December 31st. Uh, and I think it's a really wonderful way of kind of understanding, well, trying to understand time on a broader scale. Uh, so you see sort of like origin of the universe there, January, nothing really happens for a long time. Uh, we've got multicellular life in November. You know, we're already in November, by the way. That's 11 months out of a 12 month calendar year. Um, and then humans come around sometime later. Um, on the 31st of December, so the last day of that, that calendar, which is pretty remarkable. Um, not even in the morning, it's like 10.15 and we're starting to evolve. Um, and then the last 60 seconds, um, these sort of like very large changes happen um, to humanity. With Columbus arriving in, in, the, in America, what's, what's now, you know, um, the U.S., uh, one second to midnight. So, you know, the last 500 years of our history, which of course feels like quite a large time span, to me at least, um, happened in the last second of the sort of cosmic calendar. So, interesting way of kind of thinking about these overlapping time scales. Of course, this, as, a, as an infographic, I think it works pretty well. Um, maybe it could be improved here or there. But uh, as a piece of visual artwork, it's not all that interesting. So, I'm trying to kind of come up with ways of showing time and understanding time that's that's, more, that's less like an infographic and more like artwork. Um, one of the first ways I did this was in graduate school. This is a piece called Tree Fell. Uh, I filmed or videoed a tree being cut down in someone's front yard. Um, and it took the tree cutting service about three hours to cut this tree down. Once I kind of edited out all the little sections where they weren't actually cutting on the tree. Uh, and then I took that three hour video and I slowed it down to last for, an est for the estimated lifespan of the tree itself. So this tree, with dendrochronology counting the rings of the tree once it was cut down, was roughly 80 years old. So then I slowed this video down, this three-hour video, to last 80 years. So it's been playing uh, since 2007, and it'll play until 2087. Uh, each frame of the video lasts about 80 minutes. So it's not a terribly interesting video to watch. Uh, I'd say it's quite boring, actually. Um, but it sort of shows us what it would be like potentially to, uh, for a tree to take as long to get cut down as it took for it to grow. So it could kind of change the way we understand ecology in a way. Um, that's a photo. So that's just a video still. Um, a couple of years ago I pulled that still. Um, so it's missing a few extra branches at this point. Um, and then this is a, photo, a color photograph that's to scale. So it's roughly 40 by 60 inches of the, of the tr stump of the tree. I'm really interested in the history of photography, the way it's been used culturally, socially, scientifically. It's a really fascinating media because it's such a young media. It was invented 160, 170 years ago, uh, which is quite recent. And uh, you know, even from the very onset, it was this deeply, deeply subjective media where it was, it was being manipulated you know, even in the second that you push the trigger on a, on a, on a camera, you're sort of making a subjective decision. Uh, but people were already in the 1850s were kind of piecing things together, making these composite images, trying to kind of fool people into believing something. Um, and it, forever it's been used in that way where we're trying to kind of prove something through a photograph, even though a photograph maybe shouldn't be used to kind of prove anything because of how subjective it is and how, how valuable it is as a, as a medium. Uh, but it has this kind of indexical nature that we want to believe because something had to be in front of the camera to receive that image. Uh, and so this is a series of photographs, uh, found images from well-known cryptozoology cases where I went in and took out 
the, in this case, uh, Sasquatch. This is like the original Bigfoot film. Uh, the Patterson Gimlin film from the 1960s. Went in and took out uh, the guy in a suit, or perhaps Sas Sasquatch, if you want to, uh, you know, believe and believe that. I do kind of want to believe, but uh, that's a conversation for the minute. So went in and took out the man in the ape suit in this instance, and then this image got printed on newsprint. So I'm taking this analog manipulation, somebody running through the woods and filming it on a like 16 millimeter film camera, and then digitally altering it, pulling it out in Photoshop, which you know takes a few minutes if you know Photoshop, and then printing it in this deeply analog way to think about kind of the evolution of photography, the evolution of manipulation, and the medium itself. Um, so it's, it becomes a loose print, uh, which is perhaps like maybe the original way that people encountered this image as well. So it kind of doubles back on itself and becomes once again this kind of uh, evidence of something, right? We're not sure what. And there's the original film, uh, there's the freeze frame from it, so you can see where he's uh, missing from my edit. And then this is the original surgeon's photo from uh, Loch Ness in Scotland. 